The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Isaiah 9, 2. This is the key verse of the church that today's guest now serves as a missionary and worship leader. Raised in Lebanon and recruited by an extremist Muslim group, he will share his journey and where it led him and how the light from above came to him as he walked in darkness. From a Muslim extremist to a follower of Jesus, stay tuned. Drown me in your love Mercy flowing The flood is rising Drown me in your love Welcome to Everlasting Love. We are so excited that you have tuned in and we hope that you enjoyed the music at the top of the show. We want you to know that we are here for you should you need a prayer request 
or maybe you'd like some help finding a church in your area, feel free to reach out to us on our website at www.everlastinglove.tv.com or give us a call at 773-286-2171. Well, again, we're glad that you tuned in today. We have Hisham Shehab with us today of Salam Christian Fellowship Church. And in our opening, in our teaser, and we talked about extremist Muslim to follower of Jesus. So if, if that wasn't uh, enticing enough to learn about your story, I don't know what is. So we just want to jump right in and hear your story of, of growing up in Lebanon, correct? And being an extremist in the, in the Muslim community and then finding Christ. Tell us about that. Thank you for having me. I was born in Lebanon, south of Turkey, not in Indiana, Lebanon, Indiana, okay, <laughs> and in the Middle East. And uh, I was born in a Sunni Muslim family. The Shihab family claims that they have descended from the tribe of Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. So we were very proud of our lineage. And, uh, you know, the Shihabs in Beirut are some like 5,000 people. And uh, you have Shihab mosque, Shihab school, Shihab grocery, you see. Everywhere you go, there is a Shihab, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we were very proud. And uh, w I grew up uh, going to Shihab uh, school, actually, you know, a, an Islamic school where I was taught the Quran, uh, how to recite the Quran properly. I took a certificate in that. Later, I memorized more than half of the Quran by heart. And wow. I was the best at classical Arabic. So, uh, but uh, we, uh, I was born in 1960, so I used to see Israeli jets flying, you know, breaking the sonic barrier, as they call it, the sound barrier, and I was wondering what's happening at the, an early age. In 1967, I witnessed when I was seven years old mm -hmm. uh, the first uh, Israeli Arab war, my, my first war, you know. So we were wondering what's Palestine, what's Israel, what's going on. And we lived in a community full of tension. Uh, there were Muslim boys, Christian boys. W I couldn't understand why there w any fight would, I mean, among the boys and the kids, you know, it would turn bloody. The first count encounter with a Christian boy was really uh, terrible for me. So you were I was seven at this time. I was seven years you're, old. You're, you're experiencing this tension. You're yeah. thinking, why, why is there tension between... Yeah. Okay. So I was playing marbles in the field when uh, uh, Pierre, uh, means Peter in French, uh, uh, I mean Pierre is Peter in French. Uh, Pierre, I was just laying marbles, I looked up, Pierre had a stick in his hand, that stick a nail. He banged me on the head. Mm -hmm. The nail uh, missed my eye, you know, you see a scar here, and uh, blood spattered my face, and that was my first encounter with a Christian boy, you know. So I couldn't understand what's going on. So going to the mosque, uh, Muslims pray five times a day, you know. And going to an Islamic school, we were drilled to 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 do the prayers. But uh, the 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 time for uh, the practice was noon because Muslims pray at dawn, at noon. Uh, afternoon, sunset, and evening, five times a day, you know. Devout mm -hmm. Muslims go to the mosque five times a day, you know. Imagine if you're going to church five times a day, beginning with That's very with committed. Dawn. Yeah, very mm -hmm. committed, you know. So uh, at noon there, uh, there was a young Muslim preacher from the Muslim Brotherhood. He was a firebrand, and uh, he was explaining the problems between Palestine and Israel, and he said that Muslims lose Palestine because they are not following uh, the Prophet of Islam anymore. They followed, some of them follow the West, some of them follow the Soviet Union. And, uh, and uh, uh, this, if we go back to the real Islam, to the original Islam, we'll go back to the, gr the, the, the days of the glory of Islam when Islam was an, a global empire, etc. So uh, I was interested in this, you know, uh, interpretation of uh, the situation then. So he gave me books written by the founders of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, really. Uh, he, ha he was a member in the Lebanese branch here in, there in Beirut, and it w they were very interesting, those books, but we were taught 
by those uh, thinkers, if I can call them that, the world is divided into two parts, the world of Islam and the world of infidels. And it's the duty of Muslims to convert the other part of the world through persuasion, you know. But if they couldn't convert them through persuasion, they should really subjugate them by force mm. because non-Muslims do not know what's good for them because the divine law of Allah is above all and Allah knows best for anybody. So uh, at the age of 12, you know, I was reading these things and uh, just uh, digesting them. But uh, at the age of 13, uh, and by the way, my only brother, my only sibling was also in the group. He was two years older than me. So I was 13 and my brother was 15 when, when we were, were invited to, to our first military training camp in the mountains. And what was the name of the group? Uh, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. Got yeah. it. Okay. So uh, we were invited to our first training camp in the mountains and uh, there we, we were taught how to shoot rifles. How to, how to shoot rocket propelled grenades. Now, don't really misunderstand that, uh, uh, sorry for this, that uh, Muslim Brotherhood is a militia. It, it's not, it's a, a comprehensive movement, so like, you know, they call it a revivalist movement, you know. And what are and they looking to revive? Ah, uh, okay. Uh, they, they are trying to revive the Muslim community, you know, like, uh, if I can say, the reformation in the church in the 16th century, you know. They, so they w are trying to bring back the Muslim global, the global Muslim state. Uh, Muslims in 1918 uh, lost uh, what they call the caliphate, the is the seat of, of the successor of Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam, after the First World War. So Muslims feel that they are without a head, you know, like if the Catholic Church is without a pope, you know, sure. it's the same analogy, if you like to say, you know. So Muslims believe that the, the Muslim ummah or community is without a head. So they are trying to revive the Muslim community in order to uh, set a plan and uh, set the social fabric for the revival that would bring again a global Muslim state ruled by a Muslim ruler, you know, like the old days, the glorious days of Islam. Okay. So I kind of, uh, I was part of this in, in uh, Lebanon, Beirut, Lebanon, and uh, and I, I took training for two years uh, b before the civil war broke out in Lebanon between Christians and Muslims. Mm -hmm. Now, Lebanon is, let me explain, as the only Arab country that has a Christian president till today. It was by mandate and now by constitution that the president should be Christian. So the Christians in Lebanon were not persecuted by Muslims. Actually, they were trying not to give the Muslims who were increasing in number any political rights. Mm -hmm. uh, let me say that many Christians in Lebanon followed Western ways of life and they had two, one kid and a dog, while the Muslim families had 10 kids, seven kids, etc. Mm -hmm. So with time, Muslims started to outnumber the Christians in Lebanon. The Christians used to be 50% of the population. Okay. Now they are around 13%. You, you know, you see how the difference in in less than 50 years, you know. So uh, so uh, the Christians and the Muslims were engaged in a tug of war for political power. In 1975, a Christian militia ambushed a, a uh, uh, bus uh, uh, traveling in a Christian area, uh, driving Muslims. They killed 34 people, OK? and. A Muslim militia retaliated, and an and all-out civil war broke out the next day. Mm. At the age of 15, I found myself in the street with a rifle, you know, wow. going to high-rise high buildings, sniping at Christian neighborhoods. Uh, Do you remember what you were thinking at that time, 15, and uh, your? I felt that I should defend the Muslim community against what we called the Crusaders, because we kind of Muslims, you know, uh, project the f the present on the past, f or or, or if I can say the past on the on the present, and they see in, in uh, uh, Christian militias then, and also in, if I can say, American forces in Iraq or Afghanistan as crusaders, you see. So uh, I felt that, together with my brother, who was older than me, that we, we uh, should defend our community against the Christian crusaders. And uh, 
one day, I, I'll never forget this because it led to another thing. Uh, my brother and I uh, took a small c a mortar cannon to, to uh, try it uh, at the shelling the largest Christian neighborhood in Beirut, mm. Al Ashrafi, it's called with those mortar uh, uh, you know, shells. And after the third shell, I didn't feel uh, comfortable. I, I told my brother, let's pull out. I don't feel this is right. We are shelling civilians. I know this is a small cannon, but it could really, mm. uh, th because the, 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 the bomb would go like two miles and explode somewhere that you don't know. There may be women, children, innocent people. So I, we pulled out and uh, and I, uh, I, I was still 15 at that age, you know. And but there was uh, something in your consciousness yeah, that yes, thought, you know what, yeah, this just, I, yeah. this isn't what I wanted. So to I went to uh, directly to the head of the Muslim Brotherhood in Beirut and asked him this question directly. I signed up to defend the Muslim community, but today I saw myself shelling uh, innocent people. I don't know what happened. W uh, can you justify this for me? He asked me a question who could that could be a key to understand uh, the Islamic uh, uh, divine law, if I can say, or the Islamic religion. He asked me, who is your example in life? I said, Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. He said, well, Muhammad shelled his enemies with catapults. And catapults are medieval uh, machines, blind medieval machines. Also, mortar cannons are blind machines. You know, and you should understand. Hmm, I thought, maybe hmm. he's right. He said, uh, then, you seem to be like a thinker, and uh, I heard you recite the Quran, you're good, and uh, would you like to be one of our preachers in the future? I said, thank you, this is an, in, an honor. So he assigned me a mentor from the uh, Syrian Muslim Brotherhood, actually, who was living in exile in Beirut. And in less than six months, they microwaved me into a preacher. And I was ready to give my first Friday sermon. You know, Muslims. Did you say microwaved you into a yeah, preacher? Yeah, in <laughs> quickly. I've you never know? heard it quite that way. But so, so six uh, months, you're yeah, ready to go. Yeah, uh, before I turned 16, actually. You know, So uh, I was ready to, to give my first Friday sermon. And I prepared everything. I memorized everything, ready to go. But God had a different plan mm. for my life, you know. And uh, I, uh, I had a few days off where I went to visit my aunt in her summer home in the mountain. It's actually Bikaa Valley. And uh, on the road, I wasn't driving. My cousin was driving. We got into a head-on collision. Oh, wow. Instead of giving that Friday service, I was hospitalized for 50 days wow. uh, at the American University Hospital. I was bedridden for one year, really, because both legs were broken, multiple fracture in dif different parts of my legs, and I couldn't even walk on crutches. At the American University of Beirut, I was uh, seeing uh, uh, doctors and nurses speaking in English. It was the language of instruction. And it excited my interest in medicine, especially after I saw my bone and flesh torn apart, mm. you know. and. Uh, I thought, why a preacher? Maybe I can become a medical doctor, especially when I saw how uh, doctors walk the hallways like half guards and push people around, you know? <laughs> I thought, well, maybe a doctor is better than a preacher. At least you make more money, right? Right. So uh, I, I put a plan to learn more English. I knew some English, but uh, because Islamic schools don't focus on English. So I knew some English, some grammar, but I. I put a plan together to learn more, teach myself more English. So I started teaching myself English through reading comic books and novels. And I got uh, uh, later some novels by uh, a Western novelist called Louis Lamour. I read all his novels and short story collections, like 84, 125, really. So by 1979, I was walking on crutches. I applied to the American University of Beirut. I was admitted as a biology chemistry student with the intention to go to the medical school. It was like a dream come true, the Harvard of the Middle East, you know. And I you're was still believing in Muhammad at this yes, time. Yes, certainly. You're still very dedicated yes. to the Muslim yeah, religion. Yeah, I, I took this academic, uh, you know, uh, way in my life, but my brother was still there in that militia, and he became a captain in, in that militia, and another really Islamic militia. So. Uh, uh, and I wanted to focus on my studies, forget about the Civil War. 
and uh, forget everything and just uh, focus on my studies. But again, God had a different plan in, for my life. My only brother, my only sibling was killed mm -hmm. by a Christian militia in my first freshman semester. Mm -hmm. I was devastated. I couldn't focus on my studies. I want to kill my enemies. And mm. uh, I got a silencer and a gun. And uh, some of those uh, who came to, the, to college, the American college, were uh, uh, members in some th of those Christian militias that they were pitted against, you know, the Muslim militia, and I thought I should make friends with them in order to, to stalk them at night easier, to know where they live, how they move at night. So, uh, so but you again- you had a plan. You, you had yeah. revenge on your yeah, mind. These plan, Christian yeah. people who I've been taught my whole yeah. life are no good. That, yeah. that, uh, Unclean, I'm gonna evil, again. you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, but uh, in the daytime, I used to go and uh, in order, as I said, in order to meet more Christians. So I kept one course and dropped. I dropped all courses except one course. I took one course at a time, and that course that I did not drop happened to be a course of cultural studies. You know, a college requirement from all students, uh, for all students, and. Uh, that course included Greek mythology, you know, uh, uh, also Babylonian myths, uh, Greek mythology, uh, the Old Testament selections, the New Testament just selections, and the selection that was quoted by the professor was the Sermon on the Mount. Mm. So I was at the climax of my hatred and seeking revenge when I heard love your enemies for the first time. I thought, wow, this is ridiculous. Who could love his enemies? Or superhuman. My, my enemies killed my only brother, my only sibling, my only friend, you know. Mm -hmm. my, my mother had died three years before him, and uh, I was left with my father, who was started to ha have heart problems. Mm -hmm. I thought, who could love his enemies, you know? This is something, you know, unhuman, yeah. if I can say. To Super be able to human. love someone who's caused so much devastation yeah, and harm. To forgive. Then I yeah. came across the Lord's Prayer. So I started reading the Bible on my own. Wow. Because it's a quotation, you know. And uh, I started reading the Bible on my own, came across the Lord's prayer, prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Then you, you, you come to ask for forgiveness with humility. I thought, this is not uh, the words by human beings, you know. Then uh, I came across Matthew, uh, uh, when, uh, in, in the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus was asked by the Pharisees about the greatest command. They won't trick him. Mm -hmm. He said, love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and love your neighbor as you. Well, I thought Muslims are trying to love God more than anybody else, you know. Mm -hmm. They go five times to the mosque, not one uh, on Sunday, you know. Right, right. But this Jesus Christ is overdoing it. I had never heard anybody talking about loving God in this powerful way. I thought maybe I'm missing the truth with a capital T here. Mm. Then I thought, well, if I am really seeking the truth, I should look for it in other philosophies or religions. So I thought maybe I should explore the Near Eastern religions and philosophies, uh, you know, Hinduism, uh, etc., Buddhism. But, uh, you know, I want something also uh, real, not just read about it because uh, you, you can read the New Testament and go to a church in Lebanon, but you cannot read uh, the Bhagavad Gita and go to a Hindu. T it's not available then, it wasn't then. So uh, I bumped into a yoga teacher. I thought this is maybe something uh, could introduce me to the uh, Hinduism sure. or the Near Eastern philosophy. And I thought, uh, if I am seeking the truth, I should leave no stone unturned, you know, as they say. And I thought I should really understand the philosophy behind the yoga. And I asked her to start, uh, you know, uh, with uh, taking lessons. And she, she was one of a British lady that was discipled by the gr uh, disciples of the great Mahatma Gandhi, really. Mm. Lived many years in India. And she said, uh, well, uh, you are not ready. You have to cleanse your body. I said, well, in Islam, we, you know, we do ablutions, you know. In Christianity, you are baptized into the faith. In Islam, we do ablutions, you know. Mm -hmm. And s if you're not Muslim in the beginning and you be t uh, convert to Islam, you have to take a shower or, you know, or a bath, you know. But 
I said, so should I take a bath? She said, no, I mean you have to be vegetarian before you do physical yoga. So I was a guy full of hatred. Yeah. At the age, age 21, I was doing three martial arts because I wanted mm. to kill my enemies with my own hands, bare hands if needed, you know. Wow. So and I had to uh, d get energy from fruits and vegetables, okay. Uh, so I ended up munching on fruits av and vegetables half of the day and spending the other half of the day in the bathroom because of the fibers, you know. <laughs> oh but I did great at <laughs> yoga. I was, in two months, I was able to do, uh, put my, uh, stand on my head, put my feet behind my head, and she said, you are the most serious student I had ever seen. Now we'll give you what they call transcendental meditation. We'll give you a mantra that will dig into your soul. And then you'll climb up to God step by step through spiritual exercises. This is the only way, she said, through spiritual exercises. So a mantra is a Sanskrit word according to your height and weight and health, etc. So I had to repeat that mantra thousands of times in order to go step mm. by step and have union with God. Mm -hmm. The more I repeated that mantra, the more stupid I felt, actually. If you remember David Carradine and his Om, it sounded something sure. like that, you know. Yeah, yeah. So the more I repeated that mantra, the more stupid I felt. The more I, I repeated that mantra, the more I felt that I am not climbing up t to God. I am really going down in my filth, actually. And I realized that we try with our spiritual exercise to climb up to God. We try with our works to ascend to God, but we cannot do it on our own. Only in Jesus Christ, God himself descended to us and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So how do you get to that point from being an extremist? Now you, you talked about how the Sermon on the Mount and you read that and the fact that Jesus says, love your enemies, really struck you and you thought, that isn't a, something a human would say, so this has, there has to be some divinity in this. So he started getting your attention. Yeah, I was but reading the New Testament on my own. I mean, doing yoga as well as mem finishing memorizing the Quran at the same time. Hmm. But the Holy Spirit, you know, worked in my heart, you know, at that point, you know, that I tried to start to compare how can we reach God and I felt only Jesus Christ is the way. Well, you know? how, that's like, I'm sure people listening are thinking, oh my goodness, like how do you go literally from one extreme to another? Well, we, we serve a great God. Yeah. And uh, I mean... Uh, do you remember like the, the turning point? So there was a series of events that just got you thinking, literally laid you up in bed for a year. You were unable to get around. You had a lot of time to think about things and you have uh, the, you know, these encounters. There were many things also, let me say, comparing between the Quran and the Bible. I discovered the fragmentary nature of the uh, nar narratives in the Quran and the, how the Bible brought the, uh, the real uh, stories and uh, I was deep into the interpretation of the Quran as well. I taught the Quran as well. I used mm. to gather five people at before dawn every day, you know, seven days a week, you know, teach them the Quran, mm -hmm. you know, but, but I discovered that you cannot understand actually the Quran without going back to the Bible in many ways, you know, and God used his word, which is mightier than a double-edged sword, to open yeah. my heart to Jesus Christ. Uh, there is Brother Andrew, for example. I met him in Lebanon, and uh, this is a digression maybe, but I met him in Lebanon and translated for him, took him to the one of the founders of Hezbollah, and we gave him a Bible in Arabic. Uh, Brother Andrew says that the, Ara the Islamic culture and religion build a brick wall between the Muslim and the har his heart, bet between the Muslim and Christ. But the Holy Spirit removes the first brick and mm. Christ goes in, you know. Mm -hmm. it's with, with God, all things are possible. Muslims today are seeing Jesus in visions and dreams. You know, uh, as Salam Christian Fellowship, many people have seen Jesus in visions and dreams. And they are coming and saying, what does this mean? Shall I be baptized? Yes, I say, you know. Uh, in addition to the teaching, you know. Right. So they're just they're just seeing Jesus in these visions, and that's causing them to wonder yeah, what's yeah, happening. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, some of them also uh, come to Salam for the social event. We have, uh, you know, we're uh, trying to create a community with uh, 
a, an informal worship service and the lunch after that, and we do social services. Some of them quit for a, one year, then they come back like a lady uh, two weeks ago came. She said, I saw Jesus in a dream, and he healed me. Mm -hmm. This is why I'm coming. You know? mm -hmm. uh, I'll tell you more about this. But I, I'm saying in seven years, really, it took me seven years to say I'm out of it. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I want to follow Jesus Christ. You know. It took time, you know, but mm -hmm. uh, I mean, bit by bit, God was revealing the truth to me, you know. Uh, how, how does the Muslim community react? Like, what were people's reactions to you when you literally did a 180? I shared with my friends mm -hmm. and uh, later my wife, and uh, they thought I'm nuts, you know, and uh, uh, this c maybe they thought this is an adventure, maybe you mm -hmm. know. And but God was taking me, you know, bit by bit, till I, I met a group uh, who came to Lebanon, American group uh, from the vineyard. That was the first uh, kind of. Uh, I used to go to a uh, an evangelical Bible church in the neighborhood uh, in Beirut near the American University of Beirut. I used to sneak in and sneak out before the pastor grabs me because, you know, as. I am, my face shows that where I am from and what family I belong to. We have a small mm -hmm. genetic pool there, you know, and they intermarry and once you see a shihab, you know him. That's a shihab or et cetera, you know. So there are seven uh, large families in the neighborhood. Uh, they know all each, all of them know each other, you know. So I used to sneak in and out and I uh, didn't want to, I was still thinking, is it uh, worth the persecution, you know. So I was, in the beginning, a closet Christian, as they say, you know. Okay. So till I uh, met uh, in the 90s a uh, group from the vineyard, and they considered me one of their elders, and we started really evangelizing. And uh, uh, actually, it, it took many, uh, in many ways, God brought me through also Islamic-Christian dialogue. I used to be engaged in Christian Islamic dialogue in the Middle East, in Jordan and Beirut, Lebanon, and other places. And I used to see who is a candidate for me to share my story with, you know, in mm -hmm. order to see who, who is open. Because as, as Jesus said, it's, uh, you know, like uh, the seed, you throw them on the, on, the, on the ground. If it falls on fertile ground, you know, it, it will really... Kind of, so I was looking for the fertile ground among people, you know. So your conversion so, really happened over time. Yes. And then, so you, you go again from um, extremist, Muslim extremist, to follower of Jesus, to... And a peacemaker. Peacemaker. In, in 1989, I, I founded a Christian Islamic Dialogue Association and st tried to build a bridge between the Christian community, which I was trying to follow Jesus, you know, and I started to know more and the Islamic community, you know. I was accused of being many things. One of them in, in, in the Arab world, they say a Freemason means, you know, something. And there it's a, a bad, you know, that mm -hmm. uh, because they can't understand, you know, the, f uh, the freedom in Christ, that uh, this openness, you know, to bring people together. So I try to mm -hmm. contribute to the to the country after the end of the civil war through dealing with the trauma of the civil war in, in both uh, communities, bringing people together. I worked with many uh, uh, bishops also, helping them also, introducing them to uh, the Muslim community, etc. You know. So tell, uh, tell us a little bit about Salam Christian Fellowship. So that's a, a church that you currently minister at, you're pastor yes, of. Yeah. So tell, tell us a little bit about how that how that came to be. Let me uh, explain that in uh, 2001, I was, uh, you know, I, I didn't do medicine at the American University of Beirut. God, uh, you know, changed my life there, and I was derailed from that. So I did uh, a master's degree in Islamic uh, history, you know, and later I went for PhD studies in another college there. But uh, I, in, in, uh, in the 90s and uh, early 2001 and 2, I was a, a full-time journalist and a, an adjunct professor at the American University of Beirut teaching history of the Middle East and Europe when I was going one day into a bank building and bu I bumped into a retired Lutheran pastor from northern Minnesota. And that pastor, uh, Reverend Bernie Lutz, uh, promised his wife after he ma pastored many churches in northern Minnesota, where it's so cold and snowy mm -hmm. that when they retire, he'll take her south. So he took her to Lebanon. And there, uh, 
he was going into that bank building when I bumped into him in the elevator and uh, he was uh, giving his card uh, in the elevator there were five people and saying God is love in Arabic you know now God is love in Arabic is Allah Mahabba mm -hmm. he was he butchered the whole thing he said Allah blah blah so he was funny but he came across on fire for the Lord <laughs> so I took his card the card said Lutheran Ministry of the Middle East now I taught Luther and the Reformation in college but he was the first Lutheran specimen I had ever seen there's there there was there's no Luther, Lutheran church in Lebanon there is an office called Lutheran Hour Ministry where they do radio broadcasting etc so he needed uh, somebody to help him translate his Bible studies into Arabic because nobody was coming so I volunteered to do that uh, half day and uh, of my uh, busy schedule and uh, in three years, he said, uh, Hisham, why don't you come to uh, uh, to Michigan where there is a big, you know, Arab population, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, actually, the first plan was to, uh, I was immigrating to uh, Qatar to work in Al Jazeera to help them build a website. You've heard of the Al Jazeera. Right. So, so, you, so you didn't predict that you would be in Michigan. No. But, if, but if you fast no, forward no. the story a little bit, now yeah. you find yourself in Michigan of all places, yeah. which probably was never on your radar. Yeah. And so is that where the, the planting of Salam uh, happened? The, the plan started there, but it didn't fruition there. It did in Chicago. Mm -hmm. So from Michigan, I went to seminary, commuted to Indiana. It was uh, not very far. And, uh, and uh, Concordia, Fort Wayne, you know, I took, in took intensives, actually. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, before I finished my pastoral studies, I was advised to move to Chicago, where there's more support for the mission. And this is what I was told. So now uh, when they told me Chicago, I heard Al Capone, you know, because oh, I, mean, I didn't know what's Chicago, <laughs> but Al Capone, you know. So I thought um, this should be a difficult place. So I started commuting uh, by driving my conversion van. Uh, I had a Ford con old conversion van where the back seat turns into a bed, you mm -hmm. know. And uh, and uh, I kind of uh, wanted to test the waters, see where is a Muslim population, an Arab population. But uh, 2006 was actually Thanksgiving 2006. I dev decided to move the whole family. To, to Chicago land, and uh, after I found a parsonage, you know what I mean by mm -hmm. parsonage, yes. a, mm -hmm. a, uh, yeah, a, a house owned by the church to rent. Yeah. So uh, I decided to outsmart the people in Chicago and travel at night to avoid the traffic, actually. So Good I set out from an Arbor, Michigan at 9 p.m. As soon as I hit 294, I discovered that they close all lanes at night and keep one lane open for road works, you know. And you sit in traffic again, but behind trucks. And I thought, wow, this is really a mission impossible. Who could plant an Arabic church where I can barely drive the, the highways, you so know. So is that how you ended up in Lombard? Because that's where you are now, is in the suburbs. Yeah, right? but, but what's with man is impossible, with God is possible. So I, I actually, it started in Wheaton. Okay. So uh, I was giving, uh, if uh, we do so social services, so I started giving a food basket uh, for the uh, Easter in 2007, actually, and I bumped into a woman from uh, Palestine. He, she was a refugee, mm -hmm. and uh, she was like a, the Samaritan woman to me. She went out and told the people about me. We started a Bible study in two months, you know, and then after instruction, we discovered that people are interested in converting and baptism. We baptized seven people. Yeah. In one year, we started an, um, uh, a formal worship service, March 2008, mm. and where 25, 40 people come from the Middle East. We evangelize from the pulpit as if you are standing at a street corner. We invite everybody, you see. Which is, a, which is a good question I want to ask you. How, how do we, especially those who may not have a Muslim background, the Chicago area, Chicagoland area, has a, a high Muslim population, and I think it's growing. How do we come alongside those of us who are followers of Jesus? How do we engage with the Muslims in our neighborhoods? I think love covers everything. If you show them uh, original friendship and love, you'll win their hearts. And uh, my son, when he came to the United States in 2004, he described it as a social desert. 
and went back to the Middle East, you know. Mm. And uh, uh, we are, we come from very socially active communities and they come here, they find uh, stark individualism and the, with less friends, with less family members, especially after 9-11, they are considered sometimes mm -hmm. the enemy within. So ex if extending a loving hand to them means a lot. Yeah. So love first and then understanding, really. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, we, uh, we invite them to our events. We uh, respect uh, their culture. For example, we don't really, uh, we do a lunch where we don't uh, offer any bacon or I mean any ham, that was because they don't eat pork, for right. example, you see. So uh, we don't drink in front of them, we don't let anybody drink, you know. So we kind of uh, try to contextualize, you know, as pa uh, St. Paul contextualized the gospel in Acts 17 to the Greek, you know, we try to contextualize actualize the gospel to them you know it doesn't mean need it's not rocket science it's sure. love which talks you know so what are some of tell me some of the the stories of how God has worked through Salam Christian fellowship uh, let me explain uh, out or tell the story of a guy from Iran uh, I baptized him at the age of 55 uh, he I received one day a call out of the blue uh, he was uh, uh, a, a cousin of a guy who came to Salam and uh, he said uh, I have throat cancer and I have chemotherapy. I didn't understand much about chemotherapy th then. Could you drive me to uh, Loyola in Maywood for chemo? I said okay fine you know. Uh, it would take, if he takes it public transportation to take him more than two three hours to get there from uh, you know uh, Carroll Stream, Illinois. Okay, So uh, I drove him there, then he came down, he said, well, tomorrow the same thing. I said, what do you mean? He, sa he said, it's f four days a week. I told him, oh listen, goodness. I lose <laughs> all my day on in traffic, you know, and uh, so we got two volunteers to drive him, and I drove him two days, etc. maybe one day another volunteer, but after f some months, uh, he went through chemo, and we put thousands of miles on our vehicles and he went to surgery and removed the lump from his throat. But he started coming to the to the church, to the Bible studies, ask deep questions and uh, and one day he he had surgery, you know, removed the lump and but he he was so sore and stiff and moving like a robot and he couldn't really move and he asked to be baptized, you know. Wow. I said, Okay. So I baptized him in the church at night actually and he went home and saw Jesus in a dream. Mm -hmm. His name is Shaker and Jesus asked him, Shaker, what 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 aches you? He said, My neck is so sore I can't speak because you know the surgery was fresh mm -hmm. fresh and I can't raise my shoulder. I can't move. When he we baptized him he was like a robot like this. He bent down like a robot. And Jesus put his hand on his neck and shoulder and told him, wake up, you are healed. Shaker woke up, moving normally, his voice went back to normal. He rushed out of his mm. apartment, knocking on doors. He lives in an apartment <laughs> complex, waking up all his relatives. Wow. Jesus healed me, Jesus healed me. You know, so this is uh, one of them really. Uh, th the last baptism actually was a man seven, seven ye 77 years old from Iran. Uh, you know, sometimes somebody plants a seed and uh, you reap the fruit. A, uh, a priest uh, uh, 20 years ago shared with him, mm -hmm. you know, in Iran, you know, and he came as a visitor here and helped him. I helped him through many things and, and he said, you know, I am really interested in Jesus and I want to follow him, you know. I said, okay. Can, uh, so I we do, we call it catechism, I don't know if you, uh, the Christian instruction. And uh, after that, I baptized him, 77 years old. Wow. Who could do this but Jesus Christ? Right, amen to that. Amen. So you mentioned a little bit earlier that um, at, from 9-11, there's a sense of yeah. fear yes. and how some of the American population views people in, in the Muslim population. So what, it, it, Talk to me a little bit about Islam and terrorism. Uh, 
you know, I, when I said about Islam and uh, who is your example in life as a Muslim, I really meant to say that Islam, uh, you cannot describe it as a religion of peace, okay? Mm -hmm. But Muslims are peaceful. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, most of them are peaceful. 15% of them are extremists. And 15% of them have an agenda when they come to the West. They want to, to change the social fabric. Uh, because I was one of them, I know when I go to a mosque and uh, see the way they talk, not all mosques, some mosques, I know that this guy is a, a Muslim activist and he has an agenda, you know. So around 15% of them really have this agenda to, so to change the social fabric in the West and they are motivated, they are generous, they are uh, hardworking. You see, and uh, and uh, if we really we don't share the gospel with them, with the Muslim population, they'll be able to hijack all of the Muslims. You know, mm. we need really to be as more active than they w they are really is in, in it, this. Is it accurate that the that the Muslim religion is even gaining a lot of momentum and uh, almost twenty five? Southern people convert to Islam wow. in the West uh, every wow. year. Why, why do you and think that uh, is? There are many things that uh, attract, attract people to Islam in the West. One of them is uh, this active social community and uh, if I can say the dignity that, that Islam gives to women sometimes because uh, women in the West are seen as a commercial object sometimes, you know. Hmm. And uh, some I I I've, I started a campus ministry at College of DuPage, and I saw many white American converts there. And uh, really? you see that they, when they cover, they feel that uh, they 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 are not, uh, you know, objectified as much. Yeah, yes, yeah. you know, hmm. and uh, so uh, the social uh, active community is an attraction, as also the simplicity of Islam. Islam is a rational religion, you know. Uh, uh, Christianity asks you to give your heart to okay. Jesus, right. while to be reconciled to God through Jesus. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. But in Islam, you can rationalize and come to faith in Islam without, you know, going through all of this. Mm. You know, so it's an easy religion, very rational, very simple. You know, and it's built on works. You see. So it's, uh, they in engage them from the first day in social activities and worship five times a day that they cannot think of anything else. Uh, former President Bush uh, uh, called uh, Islamic extremis extremism Islamic fascism. And he was right by that because there is brainwashing mm. in, the, in the process, you know, and uh, especially with, uh, with the Muslim ideology, you know, of the Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda and other extremist groups. Right. So brainwashing them and uh, creating uh, people who think alike and act alike and dress alike, you know. So what, and, and you mentioned earlier, we're talking a little bit about how to engage with the Muslim population. Would you say are, are most um, Muslims open to hearing about Jesus? Or if, if someone were to start dialoguing about Christ or Jesus, what? Jesus is mentioned, is mentioned in the Quran more than Muhammad. More than 29 times Jesus mentioned the Quran, but when they speak about Jesus in the Quran, they don't mean uh, the Son of God. So they remove the sonship of Jesus and deny the Holy Spirit and believe that Jesus is, was a, just a normal human being, but a prophet. So they put Muhammad above Jesus, okay? They don't worship Muhammad, but they put Jesus uh, below Muhammad. And uh, we, uh, I, when I talk to Muslims, I go to their, their scripture, if I can call it, because Jesus called the word of Allah, the word of God in the Quran, but they don't understand what it means. I bring them into the Gospel of John. I always try to draw them into the Gospel of John and, and the, the other Gospels, because the word of God, you know, is spirit. And uh, and uh, I can't do more than the spirit, you know. Mm -hmm. So I draw them all the time, and they are interested to hear what you you think. But you need to be respectful and ask questions instead of shoving it down their yeah. throat, 
you know. So, so they're very familiar with Jesus, just not the truth of who he is. Yes. So, and so engaging in dialogue, people would engage in dialogue. Certainly, and mm -hmm. uh, I, I used to be part of uh, the Christian Islamic dialogue in Beirut, Lebanon, as well as an event called the National Prayer Breakfast in Washington, D.C. I used to travel from Beirut uh, to Washington, D.C. to be part of that. And we used to have Muslim imams. We talked to them, we, we uh, Muslim clerics, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, dialogue is very important. This is why in uh, uh, at Salam we invite uh, all people to our celebrations, you know. We have, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the Christians who come are very, very minute you know, percentage. Sure. And so we try to invite non-Christians in order for them to hear the gospel. We invite them to their, our celebrations like, uh, and we use their culture, you know, in order to spread the gospel, push the gospel. Like they have a uh, new year called Nowruz, means a new day mm -hmm. in Iran. And this uh, new day is the beginning of spring for them. So we tell them about the new life in Christ at our event and they they come listen really and it's up to them to come back or not we okay. have to be bold with the gospel well and to your point i mean we need to share it it's the holy spirit that does the work Amen. because no yes. human person was going to convince you that jesus was the way but when you were enticed to be in his word and started reading it as you said the word is a double-edged sword and so it's if we engage our, our neighbors our friends that are co-workers that may be Muslim, we can engage them in a conversation about Jesus because they're used to hearing about him. Yeah. But then... And we, we need to preach the gospel, not ourselves, because uh, there's a difference, let me say exactly here, between uh, churchianity and Christianity. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between the gospel and sometimes Christianity, if I can say. Yeah. So you have to preach Christ not preach yourself Got it. you yeah. see and uh, this is very important you know uh, it's all Jesus centered mm -hmm. and this is what we need to do yeah keep pointing to the gospel as you said you bring them to John and you read the gospel of John with them and that really helps to uh, and as Isaiah 55 says the word of God will never return empty yeah it will uh, bring fruit where it's supposed to bring fruit you yeah know? Well, we need to end our time. This time went by so quickly, so I'd love to, to end us in prayer, if that's okay with you. Sure. Great. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving your Son on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. We ask you, Father, to bless uh, this uh, TV station and make uh, this TV station a lighthouse for the lost in Chicago. We ask you, Father, to bring uh, the lost sheep uh, to, to, to your fold, and we ask you, Father, to m move mightily in, mm -hmm. in the Middle East. Uh, we ask you, Father, uh, for peace in the Middle East, especially where uh, there is tumult there and turbulence and massacres. We ask you, Father, to show them that there is no peace without the, f the Prince of Peace, Jesus of Nazareth. In, in his name we pray. Amen. Jesus loves me, loves me still Though I'm very weak and ill That I might from sin be free Let and die upon the tree Give me Jesus I need Jesus Give me Jesus Give me
as she loves me, he will stay close beside me all the way. Thou hast bled and died for me. I will henceforth live for thee. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong. to live a mortal life You came to dwell among us here You give light It is here we take the body broken It is here we mend our hearts to our brother It is here that we Remember the sacrifice Oh, what a precious you chose us the body that nailed you to the cross you give love it is here we take the body broken it is here we mend our hearts to our brother and it is here that we Remember the sacrifice Oh, what a precious price Oh, the body broken Oh, our hearts to our brother 